Good morning, everyone. Today we are pleased to have Dr. Jason Kovacic with us for a discussion on fibromuscular dysplasia and spontaneous arterial dissections. Dr. Kovacic is an associate professor in the Department of Cardiology at Mount Sinai. He received his medical degree from the University of Melbourne Medical School, after which he completed his residency and subspecialty training in interventional cardiology at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, Australia. He subsequently completed a PhD in cardiovascular medicine at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. In 2007, he became a fellow in the American College of Cardiology and relocated to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH. While at the NIH, Dr. Kovacic discovered critical new pathways that lead to blockage of the body's blood vessels. He then moved to Mount Sinai, where he divides his time between acting as an interventional cardiologist and continuing to research new ways to prevent and treat vascular disease. Dr. Kovacic has authored numerous scientific and clinical papers on heart and vascular disease, with a particular interest in the use of stem cells to understand and treat heart disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kovacic. Great. Um, thank you for that great introduction and uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, it's a real pleasure and I'm especially pleased, and I'll say from the get-go, to have Jeff Olin and Annette King and Valentina Descamerade in the front here my colleagues without, uh, without whom any of this would have been possible. So uh, I thought I'd sort of summarize the talk that I'm going to give this morning in um, sort of pictorial form. And I'm sure you've heard of all these three separate conditions, fibromuscular dysplasia, spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD, and cervical artery dissection or S CVAD. And really what I plan to do this morning, I hope, is to convince you and show you the emerging data that some of which we've had the privilege of generating, some of which has come from others, but the data that's really starting to indicate that rather than being three separate diseases, these really are an overlap spectrum uh, of disorders. And while there are certainly patients that have these diseases in isolation, don't have features of the other, it's becoming clear both at a molecular and a clinical level that these three disorders are likely to form a spectrum complex and we're in the midst now of just questioning ourselves uh, in vascular medicine and cardiology whether these diseases actually need to be redefined, renamed and reclassified. So I'll start with a case. Um, this is a 34 year old female. Uh, as was mentioned I'm an interventional cardiologist. I was actually on call for the cath lab. This was about 2011, 2012. Uh, I was on call for STEMIs. 34-year-old female came in with no significant past medical history with the exception of having delivered a healthy baby girl 10 days prior. She was a little bit hypertensive in the last trimester and then suffered an anterior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction seven days after delivery. She was transferred to our institution and into the cath lab with chest pain and dynamic EKG changes. This was her right coronary artery non-dominant, quite a small vessel and no significant obstruction. This is her left coronary system and you can appreciate here there's this, this is the left anterior descending coronary artery and there's this fairly ugly looking appearance in the middle of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Here you can see in a cranial view this is the left anterior descending coronary artery coming down here and there's this area in the middle of the vessel and I'll pause it for you here in the middle of the vessel, you can see there's a track coming down here. There's likely two channels, uh, ectatic, a very thin course here. This is a spontaneous coronary artery dissection that this lady, young lady had suffered 10 days after delivery. Uh, four or five years ago, we still weren't as uh, adept at this diagnosis and facile as we are now. So I actually chose to uh, image this. So I've actually wired down that LAD and passed an OCT, optical coherence tomography, imaging catheter down and took a pullback. And you can see here, if I start it back at the beginning, this is the distal vessel. This is normal left anterior descending coronary artery. We come back now. There's a flap of tissue in the middle of the vessel, two lumens. There's actually hemorrhage out into the vessel wall here, multiple channels as you can see some spasm, this is intramural hematoma as we're pulling back up to the proximal part of the vessel. Again, more intramural hematoma here and we finally get up to more normal LAD at the top of the, the, top of the vessel. This OCT uh, has the advantage of actually showing me that I'm in the true lumen because one of the fears of this is this, this lady who's having ongoing and, uh, ST elevation and chest pain 
We don't like to normally intervene on these uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissections, but in people that are having refractory chest pain or ongoing ischemia, we're forced to do so. This OCT has the advantage of proving to me that I'm in the true lumen so that when I stent, I know I'm not going to actually stent into a false lumen and close the vessel down. So with the confidence of knowing I was in the true lumen, I was able to stent the lesion. She uh, actually, obviously, we terminated the ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and she did well. I would note, uh, point out to you, however, that the proximal segments of the vessel here, you can see this left main and proximal LAD is still of smaller caliber than this proximal AD, this is probably due to some residual intramural hematoma also in this proximal diagonal here. So to summarize this case, it was a 34 year old female presented with postpartum anterior STEMI with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. She did suffer a mild reduction in her left ventricular ejection fraction to 48%. At this time, this is around 2011, there was a lot of questions about this disease that we really had no answers for. Why did this occur? How should we best treat it? We'd sort of extrapolated a lot of our treatments at that time from just atherosclerotic disease. Clearly that's not the same biology. Clearly that extrapolation really might not hold very well. We really had very little idea of what her risk of further coronary renal or neurological events was. We had no idea if she can become safely pregnant again or the risk of this being transmitted to her offspring. So knowing that, I dug around a little bit more in the literature and started connecting with Jeff Olin and some of the others here over this problem. And there was emerging data coming at that time about the link between spontaneous coronary artery dissection and fibromuscular dysplasia. So specifically, a lot of this work has come from Canada, from uh, Jacqueline Shaw in Toronto. And not long after that case, this data was being presented in abstract form at the time, but this paper came out from 50 patients at Vancouver General. Mean age of 51, 98% female, 30% STEMI, 70% non-STEMI. Only one of them was postpartum. But what this very important paper showed here is that you, if you actually looked for fibromuscular dysplasia in these patients presenting with spontaneous coronary artery dissection, up to 86% of these patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection can be identified as having classical fibromuscular dysplasia. And uh, it depends, of course, how well you look, what imaging modalities you use to screen and so on. But the incidence of FMD from this and subsequent studies has now come out to be in the order of 50 to 80% in patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. How can spontaneous coronary artery dissection manifest in patients with fibromuscular dysplasia? We published this article in Journal of American Cardi College of Cardiology uh, a couple of years ago, showing that the predominant forms which of manifestation of spontaneous coronary dissection in the setting of fibromuscular dysplasia are the following. A dissection, as I just showed you in that previous case. Intramural hematoma, which presents as just a diffuse narrowing of the vessel. This smooth distal tapering, and I'll show you examples of that soon, which we now understand to be a form of tracking intramural hematoma, where there's hematoma just progressing down the vessel. And tortuosity, not an acute uh, manifestation of a presentation or ischemia, but certainly one of the uh, features that we do see on angiography. And just to show you this smooth distal tapering, this is the sort of appearance that just uh, five to eight years ago, we would have thought was just refractory coronary spasm. And I can well recall cases as a fellow of just pump pumping nitrates into patients like this, intracoronary nitrates, thinking this was some form of refractory spasm. And we really had no idea just such a short time ago that this was actually a form of spontaneous coronary dissection with tracking intramural hematoma. Jacqueline Saw has actually passed imaging catheters down there, there into these small vessels. I'm not actually brave enough or perhaps cavalier enough to do that. But nonetheless, if you are, you can actually see the intramural hematoma in these cases. So it's clear, or it was clear back at the time, five years ago, that there is this overlap between fibromuscular dysplasia and spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And certainly not everyone with FMD has spontaneous coronary dissection and vice versa, but there is a large overlap with, between these disorders. Just to wrap up on spontaneous coronary artery dissection, how we manage it and what other tests we do, we do prefer conservative management. So although I did uh, show you how we stented that patient successfully, 
up to a third of attempts at percutaneous coronary intervention end with complications. This is not the same biology as atherosclerotic disease where I think we're very facile at putting stents in. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection behaves very differently. These vessels are very friable. These dissections tend to propagate. Intramural hematoma tends to propagate and get worse. So if possible, if the patients are stable, we just leave them alone, put them in the CCU and manage conservatively. We intervene only for ongoing ischemia or instability with cautious dilation uh, to avoid propagating of dissection. We don't use vascular closure devices because there has been there's certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence among the experts in the field that manual, uh, vascular closure devices such as the Angiosil or Perclose are associated with a higher rate of complication in these, in these delicate vessels. We also strongly suspect fibromuscular dysplasia and we go on to image other vascular territories. And this is something that's been developing that we now do routinely here, but the usual modality is CT angiography from the head to the pelvis to, am to image the whole cerebral, thoracic, abdominal and iliac circulations. What, is what are the indications for revascularization for spontaneous coronary dissection? There are no randomized trials, it's expert consensus only. But there are some reasonably robust data to show that complication rates are very high if we pursue an interventional uh, invasive approach. So we only will intervene for refractory ongoing ischemia, hemodynamic instability, ventricular arrhythmias, or occasionally for left main dissection. And coronary artery bypass graft surgery may be a very reasonable approach even if the classic uh, reasons for going to bypass surgery are not fulfilled. Uh, as I've said, wiring and uh, stenting can propagate hematomas and extend dissections. There's a higher risk of restenosis because sometimes longer stents are required. Um, the spontaneous coronary dissection often involves distal segments, making percutaneous intervention very difficult. And we do prefer a femoral approach for also technical reasons and also because of the risk of radial artery dissection. So I want to change gears now and actually talk about fibromuscular dysplasia and what actually is FMD and how may it relate to spontaneous coronary dissection. This is the classic appearance of fibromuscular dysplasia in the renal and the carotid artery. And this is the so-called string of beads appearance. FMD was first yeah. described almost 100 years ago uh, by Ledbetter and Birkeland in a young child that had uh, refractory hypertension and had renal artery involvement with FMD. It's a non-inflammatory vascular disease and it's characterized by increased vascular fibroblast proliferation and collagen deposition. You can see here uh, hematoxin and eosin staining with intense uh, fibrous tissue and collagen occupying the vessel wall. The manifestations of FMD are that string of beads appearance I just showed you, focal stenosis, dissection, aneurysm and tortuosity. And obviously any of these, particularly dissection and stenosis, can progress onto thrombosis and if the cerebral circulation is involved, that can progress on to stroke, death. The, there was a histopathological classification, or there still is for fibromuscular dysplasia, but thankfully these days we really actually have to operate on these patients. So we almost never get tissue in the setting of fibromuscular dysplasia. So the histopathological classification, while it still stands, is very rarely used, and we currently adhere to an angiographic classification system of focal or multifocal fibromuscular dysplasia. And there is some broad concordance between the common multifocal form and what was previously known as medial fibroplasia. The other forms of FMD, which included an intimal and adventitial forms, are generally thought to be more uh, consistent with this focal form, which is the less common of the forms. Uh, what are the demographics and presentation features? 94% of patients with FMD are females. The mean age at diagnosis is about 54 years and there is a delay from the, uh, presentation with first symptoms to diagnosis of the order of 5 to 10 years. Uh, the cerebral arteries are certainly the most common vessels involved in presentation along with the renal arteries and that can be as headaches, neck pain, pulsatile tinnitus, hypertension, renal infarction, stroke, and if other vessels are involved, it can obviously present with spontaneous coronary dissection, myocardial infarction, or claudication if the, the limb vessels are involved. Uh, Jeff Olin is one of the uh, directors of the National Registry of Fibromuscular Dysplasia, 
and he published uh, uh, several papers over the last few years on the etiology and the preponderance of the various presentations of FMD. Uh, they have well over a thousand patients in this national registry and it's been a treasure trove of information on this disease. From that registry we know that about a quarter of patients present with dissection or aneurysm and dissection. And of these dissections, the most common location is the cerebral arteries or the extracranial carotid in about 64%, extracranial vertebral in about 20%, and the renals in about 10%. So it, it, it's sort of obvious from the name, fibromuscular dysplasia, there is a relationship between FMD and fibroblast cells. This has been known about since the 70s from uh, electron microscopy data where it was clear that there was derangement of fibroblast cells. And back in the, you know, about four or five years ago, it was very obvious to us that there was very urgent need for insights in this disease. It had been known of for about a hundred years and there was no idea about the molecular or genetic basis of this disorder. This is a pedigree of patients we had, uh, that Dr. Olin had in his clinic, and it really highlights some of the difficulties we were facing with trying to figure out the basis of fibromuscular dysplasia. Both parents were deceased. There were two affected sisters, two affected sisters, uh, and one non-affected sister. A bunch of children, but with the mean age of onset in the early 50s, these children were too young to have actually been formally diagnosed or presented with FMD. So really we were stuck with this very limited pedigree of two affected sisters, one non-affected sister, and working with this disease at a DNA level had proven pr extremely challenging. So multiple attempts at DNA-based uh, investigations of FMD had failed, and we decided that a different approach was necessary. So in 2012, Dr. Olin and I initiated the Define FMD study. Define FMD is backed by the Fibromyster Disease Society of America. Uh, and we initially targeted 200 subjects in this study. The funding was entirely by philanthropy and remains that way at this time. And our first run-in subject was done about four and a half, five years ago. And uh, what we elected to do with this disease was to take the most homogeneous population of FMD patients we could possibly put together to try and limit any genetic diversity in the group. The trials registered at clinicaltrials.gov and what we elected to do as there had been previously so much trouble in getting to the bottom of FMD using a DNA based approach we elected not to go with DNA but to go with RNA and protein to try and work towards what the basis of this disease is. And it was very fortuitous for us at the time that Eric Schatt and the, the genetics department had just been onboarded, so we brought them into the team and adopted a systems biology approach to FMD, trying to nail down the key disease drivers. So just to sidestep for a moment, and I borrowed this slide from Eric Schatt, or this movie from Eric Schatt, it's well known that within cells there is a very complex interaction among genes, among proteins, among non-coding RNA forms, and that these interactions within each cell form this very rich network uh, which drives disease and drives biology as well. Then th within each organ, within the vessel wall, within the kidney, the brain, there is a very rich crosstalk between different cell types. So for us in the vessel wall, that's crosstalk between smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells. It's not just these cells in isolation, but a rich dialogue that occurs uh, in, in the vessel wall and in any organ. And then of course within the body there's crosstalk among these organ systems as well within the heart to the vessels to the brain and so on. So really the goal of systems biology is to integrate all of these rich networks to try and determine the basis of disease and the basis of the causation in our case of fibromuscular dysplasia. So we adopted this systems biology, system genetics approach with the support of Eric Schatt and his team. And just to summarise that slide, systems genetics is the use of genomic activity measures like RNA, proteins and metabolites to define disease driving molecular processes and thereby permitting their contribution to complex disease heritability to be understood. 
So what did we do to try and figure out the basis of fibromuscular dysplasia? As I said, we devised this study where we use these RNA disease activity measures using fibroblast cells. We recruited patients with only multifocal fibromuscular dysplasia and all patients were also enrolled into the US fibromuscular dys dysplasia registry so we had rich phenotypic data as well. We recruited one of the most rigorous control groups ever assembled for this disease with controls matched according to gender, race, ethnicity, age, smoking status, body, body size and number of blood pressure medications. As I said, we only took patients with multifocal fibromuscular dysplasia and excluded the unifocal form. And this is how we proceeded to do the study. We performed a, a skin biopsy from the inner forearm of all subjects, harvested this small piece of tissue about two millimetres in diameter. Valentina in the front row here actually handled all of these cells. The, the tissue is digested, plated on a culture dish, grown in culture for about six weeks and over about six weeks what we see is these sheets of fibroblasts growing out from this piece of tissue, this original piece of skin here. These are hundreds of thousands of fibroblast cells that we get over about a six week period. And, and for your interest, this is actually the first step of making induced pluripotent stem cells, which Yamanaka described for the Nobel Prize about seven years ago. So from that we harvest fibroblasts, extract RNA, and we quantitated the expression levels of about 100,000 genes using high throughput RNA sequencing at the genetics core facility here. A question we always get asked is, will these skin fibroblasts actually reflect a vascular disease? There's very good rationale for us to believe that the answer is yes. Number one, fibroblasts are the culprits, likely culprit cell, and I've already shown you data from electron microscopy that this was the case. Number two, skin-derived fibroblasts have been successfully used to model several other vascular disorders, including here this New England Journal paper from a couple of years ago from the NHLBI and NIH using from Bill Gall and Manfred Boehm. These are two advisors to our project uh, who very successfully use skin-derived fibroblasts to model vascular disorders. The third important fact is that fibromuscular dysplasia does not adhere to any traditional embryonic boundaries. As you know, Marfan's disease, for example, predominantly affects the aortic root. Fibromuscular dysplasia doesn't adhere to those boundaries, suggesting that this is a widespread systemic disorder. And finally, there is very good evidence now to suggest that there are some connective tissue features to fibromuscular dysplasia, suggesting that perhaps the FMD phenotype does extend beyond just the vascular to include the skin and the dermis. So our goal is to identify disease driving molecular processes in fibromuscular dysplasia and this, this is the core of the study that we're now conducting. We have fibroblasts from which we're extracting RNA, we're also looking at the fibroblast phenotype, we have plasma and serum for which we're extracting proteins for quantitation and we have DNA the whole thing is being integrated through Eric Schatz's team and Kerr Howe using systems genetics. Valentina, who's in the front row here, has been doing an exceptional job handling these cells. We've now enrolled 250 subjects in this study, about 120 cases and 130 controls. So what have we actually found? That's the study design. I actually want to step, change gears now and talk about what we've actually found and what, what do we actually know now about the biology of fibromuscular dysplasia. So two years ago, we took the first 104 subjects in our study and sequenced their RNA from fibroblasts. This was 57 controls, uh, 57 cases and 47 controls. So as a, a major finding for us, and this I think was the proof of concept of this whole study, in these first 104 subjects we found 273 differentially expressed genes in fibroblast cells between the cases and the controls. Uh, this proved immediately that there are major differences in fibroblast cells in FMD patients. We then uh, had the, the great honour, I think, of seeing Eric Schatz's team at full force and, and they really got into high gear. This is the flowchart of what they then did with this data. They took these cases and controls. They, we also did DNA genotyping, looked, uh, genotyped about a million SNPs uh, using an OmniExpress exome DNA genotyping. We then looked at expression quantitative trait loci, which is basically looking at DNA sites that regulate RNA levels of expression. We actually layered in a very modest uh, genome-wide expressions that data set from uh, French collaborators, which I'll show you in a moment. 
They then looked at differential gene expression, did weighted gene co-expression network analysis, built these uh, random forest models, did a key driver analysis, came up with various targets, and in the end we actually identified several key drivers of this disease process which we believe are very important in causing this vascular pathology. So just very briefly, what is weighted gene co-expression network analysis? In some ways, I think it's at the core of what Eric Schatt does best. Uh, these are gene networks. We often see these networks presented in meetings. These are usually non-directional. Weighted gene co-expression networks are Bayesian networks, which are directional. So they take many months to construct properly, but at the end of the day, when they construct these networks, the genes are at the top hierarchically of these networks are the hierarchical key regulators of all the downstream biology. And to cut to the core of what we found, this is the Bayesian network of fibromuscular dysplasia. These are eight of the key drivers that are implicated in the disease biology and it still brings a smile to my face that the p-value for the significance of this network in cases versus controls in fibromuscular dysplasia is in the order of 10 to the minus 72. So I hope I again get to see a p-value in my research of that order of magnitude, but this network appears to be overwhelmingly important in the biology of fibromuscular dysplasia. We took the two key drivers from this very important uh, disease regulatory network in fibromuscular dysplasia and have pursue, been pursuing these two key drivers very actively in our lab. We validated, uh, this is just to say we actually cross-validated this network using a couple of different methodology and the data was robust. And this is actually data on the lead key driver. And again, it's one of those great moments in uh, science and research that comes all too infrequently. The lead key driver has already been shown to be embryonically lethal in mice due to vascular formation defects and specifically due to defects with these medial cells in investing endothelial cells to stabilise the placental blood flow. So this uh, key driver that we're pursuing is involved with cell adhesion, migration, cell survival. It's an ideal candidate for involvement in fibromyalgia dysplasia. We have now, after about a year and a half of mouse breeding, bred three different conditional knockout lines of this lead key driver on fibroblast and smooth muscle cell specific uh, key driver mice. So, these mice are actually now already in the process of early study uh, and it'll be very exciting for us over the next few months to start to finally understand some of the biology of what drives FMD. So to summarise the study, 250 subjects now enrolled. We've sequenced RNA from the first 104, found 273 differentially expressed genes. We have this causal Bayesian network with a p-value of 10 to the minus 72. We have created stable fibroblast cell lines with knockout of the key drivers of the network. We have mice now, three different mouse lines with fibroblast specific knockdown of our lead key drivers. So I think it's a very, well, and it is a very exciting time for us in the lab as we begin to finally get some real insights on the biology of FMD. This is the study uh, and these are the samples we have We've only processed these samples so far. We actually have blood, which includes protein and serum, uh, RNA from blood, fibroblast cell culture media, and cell proteins that are yet to be processed. So we have a, this very rich biorepository we've built on this disease, and we look forward, hopefully, as we secure further funding, to fully uh, studying all of these different samples we've acquired. So I'm going to change gears now. That was our study. What we talk about now is a collaboration, an international collaboration that we were privileged to be involved with over the last 18 months to two years with a French group and, and uh, our collaborators, Nabila Boutonnage and Xavier from Paris. They took the classic DNA-based approach to fibromuscular dysplasia, the opposite of what we really did. They scraped up a very, very limited number of cases in, in the order of 250 cases and a control data set of about six or seven hundred and managed to find one gene, one SNP in one gene, which we subsequently helped them with other investigators in the States here to validate and replicate. And this paper was pub published a few months ago in PLOS Genetics of the very first gene, the very first SNP ever identified and associated with fibromyalgia dysplasia. So as I said, they took the opposite approach. They studied DNA rather than RNA as we did. They did a genome-wide association study. Normally in diseases we're accustomed to hearing about GWAS studies such as coronary artery disease in my case 
or whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, uh, depression, obesity, there are usually hundreds of thousands of subjects in these studies. This study had only uh, 259 cases, 700 controls, and they just managed to find this one single nucleotide polymorphism in this gene, PRACTA1, with a barely borderline certificate uh, p-value. What's interesting about this, uh, this gene is there is expression of the protein in the vascular wall. Here you can see in the, it's obviously in French, which is nice, but the healthy carotid, and you can see here in diseased vessels. What does this gene do, PRACTA1? It's involved in myofilament organization, potentially therefore giving a role in cell migration. Yeah, extremely pleasing to us was the an another proof of principle of our fibromuscular dysplasia study with using fibroblast cells is that we were able to show that this SNP that they'd identified in the middle of this PRACTA1 gene, this single nucleotide polymorphism actually regulated the levels of this gene in our fibroblast shells, cells, showing us that our fibroblasts again reflect the disease biology. And what we found is that people with the AA uh, nucleotides here have an increased expression of PRACTA1 and they also also have increased likelihood of having fibromuscular dysplasia. People with the GG nucleotides have reduced PRACTA1 expression and also had reduced likelihood of having fibromuscular dysplasia. So just a little bit about this SNP and this gene. Um, this RS9349379 lies in the third intron of PRACTA1 either an adenine or a guanine may be present. And it's one of only about uh, six to eight different SNPs that have been identified. This particular SNP is very unique in that it has an opposing risk association for different diseases. So again, getting back to the beginning slide where I said I'd try to unify spontaneous coronary artery dissection, FMD, and cervical artery dissection, this same gene, in fact, the same SNP, had already been implicated in cervical artery dissection. And indeed, what's fascinating about this SNP is that there is an association here between fibromuscular dysplasia, cervical artery dissection of almost the same strength, and also migraine headache. This is if you have the A allele present. If you have the G, you actually have a re reduced likelihood of having these disorders, but an increased likelihood of having coronary artery disease. Again, this is an extremely rare situation in biology to have a SNP with opposing risk associations. But what's really fascinating about this particular finding is that these disorders, FMD, cervical artery dissection and migraine, are all non-inflammatory vascular disorders. Whereas coronary artery disease, which is essentially all of this, is a very richly, and richly inflammatory state. So we speculate that there may be some involvement of inflammatory regulation which is involved in this PRACTA1 gene, fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection. And we are in the midst now of investigating this gene. I'm not going to show any data, but just to say we've made two separate knockout mouse lines, different to our key driver mice. These are PRACTA1 knockout mice, which we're aggressively studying at the moment. So to summarise what we know about the genetics of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, FMD and cervical artery dissection, this is clearly a very complex disorder there appear to be multiple genes involved. PRACTA1 is the first confirmed gene that's involved in fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection. And at this specific locus, RS9349379, which is in the third intron of PRACTA1, there is this reciprocal and inverse relationship between coronary artery disease, fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection. Both PRACTA1 and the key drivers from our network analysis of fibroblasts potentially cause disease by local effects on the vessel wall. And there are, in addition to all of this, several other candidates from our network analysis of fibroblasts that we're also investigating in the lab at the present time. So this is a very famous diagram. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, but it basically breaks down all of genetic heritability into this uh, one graph. What you see on the vertical axis is the effect size. So this is a weak effect size down here and a high effect size up here. And this is how common these different alleles are. So here you can see very common alleles, and here very rare alleles. So disorders such as Marfan's disease that have a single gene change, a very profound, very strong gene effect reside up here. These are rare alleles with very strong Mendelian effects. 
Down here are common variants implicated in common diseases such as obesity, hypertension, most forms of dyslipidemia and coronary artery disease. And what is starting to emerge from all of our work is that fibromuscular dysplasia likely resides somewhere here. We're not sure if it's a low frequency disorder and there are some examples of this such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's which are likely to be these low frequency disorders within the order of 20 to 50 genes involved. We don't know if FMD and this spectrum disorder resides here or closer to here but nonetheless it's certainly emerged that common forms of fibromuscular dysplasia and these other disorders are not rare Mendelian diseases as was speculated in the field for quite a number of decades. So what about fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection? Are they the same disease? We've found this one common uh, gene change which is implicated in both diseases but I would say that that gene change has a very weak effect size. Let me just go back to show you. This is the risk of disease if you have these different alleles. You can see here if you have the A allele the likelihood of having these diseases is only reduced by 20%. If you have the G allele, your risk of having coronary artery disease goes up 20%. So a fairly weak effect of this single gene. So what do we know comparing fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection? The mean age at diagnosis is slightly younger in cervical artery dissection. There's more men implicated than women, which is the opposite of fibromuscular dysplasia. And there are some differences also in the risk factors, demographics and symptoms. Uh, a lot of these patients have migraine headache both for fibromuscular dysplasia and cervical artery dissection but trauma can be a predisposing factor for cervical artery dissection. Uh, less so in fibromuscular dysplasia they can present with additional features such as tortuosity, aneurysm, dissection and stenosis. So while there is great overlap along, among these two disorders and there's obviously this common gene now identified, there's likely to be some patients which fall outside the overlap spectrum. But I do think there is uh, a lot of data and I've shown you some of it now to really suggest that it may be time for us to reconsider these three disorders as this overlap syndrome. So I'd like to finish with a case, of, I think to me of a great case uh, which came in December of just last year and I think the case highlights to me not only all of these genetic changes but are uh, uh, growing appreciation of disease etiology and presentation and actually how we manage these disease, this, this spectrum of diseases. So again this is, a, this, uh, I was on call for the cath lab, a 66 year old female with basically an acute coronary syndrome that began that morning. She was a pain as often be the case in females is a little bit atypical, it was right sided, there was some nausea and vomiting, she also felt dizzy and had a headache. She was from the Dominican Republic she was visiting. She was said to have had a heart attack in the past in the DR but this was all a bit vague and unclear. She'd never had a PCI surgery or other hospitalisation. Her only medication was aspirin, no allergies, non-smoker and no drug use. Physical exam was uh, fairly unremarkable. She was a thin Hispanic lady in no apparent distress. Vital signs were normal. Importantly hemodynamics were stable. Oxygen saturation 100%. Heart sounds were normal, no added sounds, lungs were clear, no cardiac failure, no pedal edema. This was her EKG, this case was actually presented in the cardiology department meetings. Uh, it's, there's clearly a, you know, a half to one millimetre of ST elevation in V1 and also in V5, V6. Uh, this was sort of overlooked. She didn't initially want to come to the cath lab. Uh, her first troponin came back at 2. I was shown this EKG and said let's just take her to the cath lab and sort out what's going on. On the way to the cath lab a second troponin came back at 50. So I think it was beyond question by the time she came to the lab. Now, I, I just say that this EKG doesn't meet the criteria for an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction but certainly very suggestive of an acute coronary syndrome. Chest x-ray was clear. Lateral again no effusions, very clear. Uh, this was her laboratory data. Troponin was 0.96. We made the decision to go to the lab. D-dimer was negative. And this is her angiogram. This is an LAO caudal shot. The immediate thing that strikes you is the tortuosity. This is the circumflex coming across here. Uh, two or three uh, 90 degree bends, 180 degree bend here. There are classification systems for tortuosity and this certainly is a, is a, a significantly tortuous vessel. Left anterior descending coronary artery moving away from us here, we don't see it very well. 
But here you can see the circumflex and the left anterior descending coronary artery here. And again, this appearance of this diffuse, long tapering appearance of the distal left anterior descending coronary artery all the way down here. A cranial view, this is the left anterior descending coronary artery coming straight down in front of us. And you can see at this point here, the vessel abruptly tapers down and there's this long tapered appearance here. And I can say we still gave nitrates uh, and nothing whatsoever happened to this, uh, this narrowing. So here you can see at the cranial and the caudal projection, five or six years ago, we would have just dismissed this as refractory spasm, but now we know this is a form of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, especially in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome where the troponin by this stage was known to be 50. The typical appearance of this tracking intramural hematoma. This is her right coronary artery. You can see very tortuous vessel. Uh, there's multiple uh, tight hairpin bends, 180 degree double back here at the, at the crew of the vessel. So what I did for one of the first times in my career was actually just went straight on to shoot the renal arteries. We had uh, digital subtraction angiography on the table. This is the left uh, renal artery. And you can see here, classic string of beads appearance. The, uh, the renal artery itself was tortuous and renal artery torturosity, I meant to ask Jeff how commonly he sees renal torturosity. I actually took a couple of views of this trying to lay it out and wasn't able to. Uh, but this renal artery not only had a string of beads appearance, but it was tortuous. And here you can see the uh, right renal artery. This renal, I think this is the true diameter of the vessel here. This whole segment is strictured and narrowed. You can see string of beads appearance here. Classic appearance of fibromuscular dysplasia. So this patient with spontaneous coronary artery dissection, diagnosis of FMD on the table, had no intervention for her LAD dissection. She had just one out of 10 chest pain. There was very good Timmy 3 flow down that LAD and we just left it well alone. She was managed conservatively on aspirin and Plavix, Lasartan, uh, which is, has putative uh, beneficial effects. Statins are withheld in this patient. We, we only give statins in these patients according to the lipid profile. She didn't have dyslipidemia, so we didn't give statins. There's no data to indicate that statins have any benefit in spontaneous coronary artery dissection. She was a little bradycardic. We often like to give beta blockers, but she didn't receive one as she was bratty. She was managed in the CCU for 24 hours, chest pain resolved, troponin trended down, and she was transferred up to the floor. We went on to perform a CT angiogram of the head and neck, and here it is. And you can see the left internal carotid artery has this impressive uh, S curve to it. And uh, Jeff Olin, has already published the association between the S-curve uh, of the internal carotid artery and fibromuscular dysplasia. There, wasn't a there was no dissection of the carotid, uh, but certainly this S-curve, which is classic for fibromuscular dysplasia. It can occur with age and other disorder, uh, conditions, but nonetheless is very common in fibromuscular dysplasia. So I hope that I've shown you, based on all of these uh, pieces of data, both, which is both clinical uh, and some, uh, I think, impressive studies from Canada on spontaneous coronary artery dissection, some of our own genetic data and uh, clinical research we're doing, that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that these three different disorders are likely to be part of an overlap uh, arterial syndrome. And certainly there will be patients that don't have features of all, and there certainly can, will be cases, of, for example, of cervical artery dissection, which are unrelated to this. You can have cervical artery dissection for, from endless Danlos syndrome, for example, and likewise coronary dissection from endless Danlos. So not all cases will fulfill this overlap syndrome, but I think there is a significant number of patients that will. What are we doing from our study? We've submitted a protocol modification to expand enrolment to include patients with spontaneous coronary artery dissection and cervical artery dissection into our defined study. And our plan is to start studying the fibroblast gene expression profile of these other disorders in the context of the large data set we already have from fibromuscular dysplasia patients. We've increased enrolments in sort of progressively over the last few years. We started with 200, we raised it to 400 about two years ago, and now we've just raised it to a target of 600. I would give a shout out that if there's anybody, uh, females, interested in being healthy controls for this study. We'd be only too happy to hear from you. Uh, my mum is a healthy control. Uh, she had the skin biopsy. 
Uh, Annette King is an angel. She does all of the skin biopsies for the study and has done an exceptional job. We've had no problems or complications from anybody. So if there's any females, I'm the only Kovacic at Sinai, please just shoot me an email. My email's easy to find. We're looking forward to the second International FMD Symposium and Jeff Olin is one of the organising committee members, uh, which is coming up in the Cleveland Clinic in May of this year. And I would say that Jeff is heading one of the major working groups of the meeting, which is, which is given the task of, is it time to reassess the FMD phenotype? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't time to formally start reassessing the phenotype uh, and redefining it in the literature. But I think it's certainly something that's now on our radar that we may be coming to do in the next few years. So I just finished by acknowledging all the people I have the privilege of working with, particularly Jeff, Daniela and Annette in the front row. Uh, Daniela, sorry, is off on maternity leave, but Annette, Valentina from my lab and the rest of my lab. Uh, the NHLBI, who are actually consultants on this work. Bill Gall, who heads the Undiagnosed and Rare Disease Program, is a consultant on our work in Manfred Boehm also. Department of Genetics, Kerr Howe, Johan, Eric Shad have done amazing work with the network analysis, and Roger Hajar and Valentin Fuster for their ongoing support. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your uh, bravery. Uh, the difference between uh, atherosclerosis and FMD, and there are many differences obviously to your presentation, but the age difference intrigues me partly because a lot of us work in the field of uh, aging and geriatrics, but would you comment on the, what we know about the age difference between atherosclerosis and FMD? Yes, certainly. So the mean age of presentation with atherosclerosis, the mean age of presentation with atherosclerosis is in the early to mid 60s. FMD presents about 10 years earlier. And also there's this huge difference in gender. So in FMD, the female to male ratio is in the order of 10 to 20 to one females to males. Whereas with atherosclerosis, it's in the order of, you know, about three to two favoring males over females. So they're very, very different diseases. I think the fact that FMD manifests in the 50s in most people is reflective of this complex biology, this common complex biology. There are few Mendelian disorders that manifest late in life. Um, perhaps Huntington's is one example of people that manifest in their 30s or 40s. But I'm not aware of any Mendelian disorders with an autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive type inheritance that manifest this late. And I think that's just reflective of the, the, the fact that atherosclerosis and FMD appear to share this common uh, complex disorder biology with multiple genes implicated. With atherosclerosis, there's now been 150 different gene variants involved that are associated with athero. With FMD, we've found one. And it, it's obviously a much harder disease to work with because the presentation can be so variable and there's a lot of subclinical disease. Um, so that's why I think partly that FMD has been so difficult to diagnose and to figure out the biology of. Uh, I was given the role of hematoma uh, in this disease. I was wondering if people have uh, assessed the impact of the anticoagulation regimes that are traditionally used right. for acute myocardial right. infarction? Right. It's a great question. And uh, with cervical artery dissection, as you know, we often anticoagulate patients. So we often put them on heparin acutely in the setting of cervical artery dissection. With spontaneous coronary artery dissection, there's no trial data at all. There's only anecdotal experience and case reports. And from my personal experience, I can say I've done it both ways. And I've, I've had patients with refractory dissection where we've actually anticoagulated them and just and successfully allowed the dissections just to propagate. Because for a dissection to actually stop propagating, it needs to thrombose. So the anticoagulation can be a double-edged sword. It works well in the cervical dissection to anti in cervical circulation to anticoagulate, but in the coronary circulation it seems to be a double-edged sword. And so there's no good data, but we, we don't routinely anticoagulate patients with spontaneous coronary dissection. We do it, it's one of those things we do occasionally, only every couple of years when someone's having refractory and ongoing dissection and we're backed against a wall. Jeff, would you comment on the role of 
systemic anticoagulation in spontaneous coronary dissection? Yeah, so there's no, there's no um, consensus on this. Um, there is a paper that was published last year on the use of antithrombotic and antiplatelet agents in fibromuscular dysplasia. That paper came from the U.S. Registry, which now has over 1,600 people. Um, so I think most people use dual antiplatelet therapy. Now with carotid dissections, neurologists often use just aspirin alone. There was one randomized trial of aspirin and clopidogrel versus um, like warfarin, and there was no difference between the two. I personally use antithrombotic agents in carotid dissections because stroke occurs because of distal embolization. So I figure that's the most potent, but it's not really evidence-based. Is there any issue with the small muscle cells? Because I know you started <coughs> on the fibroblast. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so we believe so, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, when I didn't present, show it, but when we actually do the staining, the, the localization of the key driver from our network analysis in the vessel wall, it's heavily expressed in the media. So, the, as you know, these dermal fibroblasts, they're sort of more myofibroblasts. Um, so we do get um, to reflect, I think, both cell biologies with these dermal fibroblasts because they're proliferating in the dish. They adopt this, it's like a synthetic SMC come myofibroblast type phenotype. It's not a true uh, quiescent you know, fibroblast in the classic sense. So. I think uh, your point is a, is a fantastic one. What if the, the biology of FMD is a, all a smooth muscle problem? We seem to uh, nonetheless be doing well with the fibroblasts as reflected by the EQTL data for Practor 1 and I think also the fact that we found these key drivers that are actually expressed in the medial muscle layer. It's a very good point. On the EKG, I think there was a hint of possible acute myocardial infarction. Agree. The normal ST uh, segment is concave up, and in your case it was reversed, convex up. Yeah. And especially in V1. So I think if you look carefully for this change of the ST segment, you can get a clue for possible acute MR. I agree. No, I, I totally agree that uh, in the context this was an acute coronary syndrome and acute MI, and the patient needed to come to the cath lab. It was just a, a great discussion point for our fellows. There was some uncertainty in the fellows whether to come to the cath lab, but I think uh, given the first, they already knew, the, we already knew the first troponin was 0.9, it was elevated. I think that plus this EKG plus chest pain, there was no question the patient needed to come to the cath lab. I completely agree. One last question. So once you have the index problem and you make the diagnosis of the disease, the question is, what is the subsequent course in terms of morbidity and mortality? Does it make a difference whether you find them young versus old in terms right. of what happens over a long period of time? Right. So I'll speak to spontaneous coronary dissection and defer to Jeff for fibromuscular dysplasia. But with spontaneous coronary dissection, there is an in incidence of second events. Uh, overall, people with spontaneous coronary artery dissection tend to do very well and there is a low incidence of mortality, but there is in about, I think it's 10 to 15 to 20% have a second event of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. But most of these do well, but there, there is a small percentage that die from this. Jeff, do you want to speak to FMD? Yeah, so um, we have a paper now that we've just adjudicated all of the events of 1,600 people that um, will be presented at the American College of Cardiology meeting next month and submitted for publication shortly thereafter. The large majority of patients do well. If you do a head to pelvis screening looking for aneurysms and dissection and they don't have it, what they have at presentation is what they end up with. In other words, it's not a progressive disease. If you have aneurysms, then you follow the aneurysm and you treat it at the time it needs to be treated. So overall, the prognosis is great. One other thing that wasn't mentioned is the frequency of this condition. The reason why the age 52, the average age is 52, is because these patients go 10 years 
from their first symptom to diagnosis. So in other words, if they present with hypertension at age 39, the average age of diagnosis is 52. So there's a long delay in diagnosis, and there's at least six studies on renal transplant donors, and between four and six percent of potential renal transplant donors have fibromuscular dysplasia. And lastly, in the NIH-sponsored CORAL trial, FMD was an exclusion to, to entry. It was a, a trial of renal stenting for atherosclerosis. Eight percent of women in that trial had FMD. In other words, they were put into the study. They should not have been. It was discovered when the angiograms were sent to the core lab and the core lab over, overread them. So this is a very, this is not a rare disease. And in 2009, there was a front page article called The Rare Disease That Isn't. That was about FMD and our program here about FMD. And I can just add as a final point that We've enrolled about 130 controls, but we've screened in the order of 150 to 200. Of the, of the 200 odd that we've screened to be controls, we've actually diagnosed FMD in three, three you know, con people that were destined to be controls. So that's totally consistent with the, what Jeff just said. In the, it's probably a far, well, it's almost certainly is a far more common disorder than appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you.